banyak orang yang bakal marah sih. beginning of the movie, we see Sita and Adil talking, and Adil tells his sister that someone spread a rumor claiming they use lard oil in their products. As a result, their loyal customers have stopped returning, causing financial problems for their parents. He also mentions that their uncle suggested their father send them to a free Islamic boarding school in a village, to which Sita jokes that he will look pretty wearing a hijab. Meanwhile, Sanjaya asks Mutia if they should just let go of the bakery as he believes their old bakery can never compete with the modern franchises. To which Mutia responds that while franchise shops are everywhere, there is only one Mr. Gunn's bakery, which is his father's legacy. When they step outside, they see a long line, and Sita tells her dad that the new donut shop next door is offering 50% off for their soft opening. After a while, Sita notices two guys bullying her brother, so she confronts them and drives them away. She asks Adil if they still bother him at school, and he replies that he just ignores them. Sita tells him he needs to stand up for himself, or they'll continue bullying him. Three tourists then visit the store, and Mutia assists one of them. Meanwhile, Adil notices a man outside acting strangely. The man enters the store and approaches Adil, who tells him the breads are still warm. Suddenly, the man starts coughing, and Adil quickly offers him some water. As the man drinks, Adil notices the earphones he's wearing. The man then says he had doubts at first, but he recorded it himself. Before leaving the store, he warns Adil not to go outside, saying it's dangerous. Just then, two of the tourists start fighting to distract Mutia, while their accomplice tries to steal the money. Sita catches him in the act, but he breaks free and starts to leave. Sita tells Adil that the man took their money, but he doesn't respond. So she rushes to her dad to inform him about the theft. Sanjaya hurries outside to confront the thief, and when Sita tells her mom, she runs out to support her husband. However, at that moment, a bomb explodes, tearing their parents to pieces. We then see Sita and Adil in the hospital, where Sita notices a cassette in Adil's hand, and he tells her that the men left it behind. The police officers ask them if the man who entered their bakery spoke to either of them, to which Adil explains that he only gave the man some water, which he drank. Sita quickly takes the cassette from Adil and tells the officers that the man didn't say or give them anything. Sita rushes home with Adil following closely behind, and she tells him she needs to understand why the man carried out the bombing. She quickly puts the cassette into the player and presses play, and to their horror, all they hear are blood-curdling screams and a demonic voice asking, who is your god? We then see Sita at the Islamic school, where the teacher tells the students that the first question the angel will ask them in the grave is, who is your god? She explains that the grave is a temporary realm where souls stay until judgment day. She asks Sita if she can answer Allah when the angel asks, to which Sita says she can. But Inaya adds that if one lacks faith, one might not be able to answer. She warns that if unable to respond, the grave will become constricted, pressing their ribs together, and the angel will then ask about the prophet and religion. Those lacking faith will suffer severe punishments, including having their bodies crushed and being tormented by stones, snakes, and fire. Sita questions why there is torture in the grave if there is also punishment in hell, to which Inaya replies that faith means believing without doubts, and that understanding comes with faith. She explains that grave torture is mentioned in the Quran and Hadith, and when Sita asks why religions use fear, Inaya says she has met many like Sita, who lack faith and end up losing it altogether. She notes that while Judgment Day may be distant, grave torture could happen at any moment since the angel could take their life at any time. When Sita asks if it's the angel or some God-fearing person who could blow them up into pieces, Inaya is left speechless. Later, Sita rushes into the forest and meets Adil, and insists they must reach the town before dark. Adil explains there are only two ways out, the east gate, heavily guarded, and an old tunnel in the west, 
rumored to be haunted. Despite Adil's warning, Sita pushes on. Adil asks why she's so focused on finding the grave mentioned in the bomber's recording. Sita explains she wants to prove the recording is fake and debunk the idea of grave torture. If it's fake, it means their parents were killed by someone driven by religion, not ghosts. They enter the tunnel and Adil pulls out his flashlight, mentioning he brought it from their move two months ago. However, as he speaks, the flashlight flickers and then goes out. As they move forward, Adil tells Sita that it's getting harder to breathe, to which she explains that there is less oxygen in the tunnel. Soon after, Adil's responses become distant, and Sita realizes he is no longer behind her. Meanwhile, Adil is shown searching for her, visibly scared. Sita then senses a presence and sees a child behind her, and when she asks the child who he is, the child slowly stands and introduces himself as Ismail. Terrified, Sita tries to escape, and when she finally exits the tunnel, she discovers that Anaya and some others have captured Adil. Teacher Umaya brings Sita to the office and explains that struggling doesn't justify rebellion. She places a red scarf on Sita, saying it's not a punishment, but a sign that someone cares to keep her from making the same mistakes. She reminds Sita that Allah gives them misfortunes if he wants to take away some of their sins or bring them closer to him. Sita says she misses her parents deeply, to which Umaya changes her mind, removes the red scarf, and puts a white one back on Sita. Sita asks about Ismail, whom she encountered in the tunnel, but at that moment, Inaya arrives and questions why Sita is still wearing the white hijab. She takes off the white scarf and tells Umaya that rules are rules, and they need to acknowledge their sins. Later, as Sita walks toward her hostel with other students, a car drives by, and one of the students points out that he is Mr. Ilhan, the owner of the school who funds their education. That evening, Sita overhears Umaya insisting that Ilham must be stopped from doing whatever he's doing to the kids. Inaya dismisses it as possible gossip, but Umaya argues that everyone knows and no one is acting. Inaya defends Ilham, pointing out how much he's done for the children. But Umaya then brings up Ismail, reminding Inaya that Ismail is dead, and asks who Ayam wants next, to which Inaya says, a deal. Sita rushes to save her brother, but a guard pulls Adil inside the house, and the guards outside stop Sita as well. Desperate, Sita tries to offer them money, but when they refuse, she attempts to fight them. The guards quickly overpower her, restrain her, and take her away from the scene. Afterward, we see Sita locked in a room, but she manages to escape through the window. Outside, Umaya meets her and hands her a bag filled with everything Sita needs to escape. She then says sorry to Sita for the things that have happened and will happen to her. When Sita reaches a dirt road, she spots the car in which a deal is being taken. She throws a stone at the car, cracking its windshield, and when the driver gets out to check who did it, Sita quickly rushes to the car, pulls a deal out, and takes him away. A deal suggests trying the gate as they approach the tunnel, thinking it might be unguarded at night. But Sita insists the tunnel is their only option, she urges Adil to stop believing in things that aren't real, warning that such beliefs lead to madness and suffering. Inside the tunnel, Adil apologizes for feeling like a burden despite being the older one, but Sita reassures him that once they escape, he can help plan their future. Adil mentions their uncle sold their house, but Sita warns they must stay hidden from him, or he'll send them back. She asks what they did to him, but Adil remains silent. Suddenly, they hear someone crying, making them both a bit uneasy. But Sita brushes it off, saying it's probably just some animals. She moves forward, telling Adil not to be afraid, and that nothing will stop them from getting out. However, she soon realizes Adil's hand feels cold. Horrified, she looks down and sees a ghostly child holding her hand, who vanishes the next moment. Frightened, Sita jumps up, demanding to know who's there and the ghostly child reappears behind her and says, Ismail, terrified, Sita flees. But as she runs, the ghostly child cries for help. Sita finally finds Adil, helps him get up, and they start running together. And as they exit the tunnel, they hear Ismail's voice pleading, don't leave me. In the next scene, we see that Sita is now an adult, working as a nurse at an old age home. A man named Ganda has just passed away, 
and Juwita suggests they bury him in the Islamic way since he has no known relatives. Suddenly, Juwita begins hearing someone humming and tells Sita that Ganda is standing next to her, asking her to sing a song he loved as a child to comfort him. Sita heads to the hall, where Pandi mentions they won't be going out today due to sadness over Ganda's passing. But Nanny still wants to go, Sita reassures them, saying they are free to go, and only then, Nanny's ring falls. Pandi asks if they can attend the funeral, but Nanny replies they'd be going to funerals every day. Sita suggests Nanny go out alone with a nurse, but Pandi insists he won't let her go anywhere without him, as she's too clumsy. After a while, a man excitedly tells everyone that his daughter is on TV, and while thanking Sita, he suggests that she should be a guest on his daughter's show, remarking that taking care of the elderly must be more important than looking after animals. Just then, Mr. Wahyu calls out for Sita, and Lainey tells Sita to go see him. Sita says, let him wait, to which Lainey playfully says if he asks her to marry him, go for it. Sita goes to Mr. Wahyu's room, where he asks her to tell his kids to leave him alone and stop bothering him. Sita informs his children that their father needs to go to his daily checkup, and when his daughter Ayu suggests having the doctor come to him instead, Sita explains that they don't treat their clients as patients, so they encourage mobility, including going to see the doctor in person. Wahyu says they treat him like a sickly old man, which is why he refuses to go home. His son insists that whatever care he's getting here, they can provide at their house, to which Wahi retorts, saying, they don't even like each other, so let's just live our own lives. After his children leave the room, Wahyu thanks Sita, to which she replies that she'll do her best to take care of him, but would appreciate it if he didn't make her tell lies. Wahyu says he has a checkup scheduled this afternoon, so technically, she didn't lie. He then tells her that he actually called her to make some tea, as other people's doesn't taste as good. After Sita leaves, Wahyu is shown trying to pick up a gun from his drawer, but his other hand stops him. Meanwhile, Ayu and Wahyu's son approach Sita, and Ayu tells her they've seen many like her, but none have succeeded. She adds that none of Wahyu's kids like him, and he doesn't like them either, and they asked him to come home because this place is costing them a fortune. She explains that Wahyu has no money left, so if she is thinking of winning his heart, marrying him, and getting rich, it's a waste of time. Wahyu's son offers her a job as his full-time nurse, but Ayu remarks that she doesn't want to see a gold digger's face every day. Sita says she can persuade him to go home and leave this place, but they have to kneel and kiss her feet. After a while, when Sita returns to Wahyu's room, she finds him sitting on his bed, crying. As she approaches to comfort him, he asks where he is, and when she tries to calm him down, he asks who she is, suggesting he may be suffering from Alzheimer's. We then see Adil, now a mortician, bathing Ganda's body. He meets Sita and asks if it's not him. Sita replies that it isn't, explaining that Ganda lived a righteous life according to those who knew him. Adil notes that doesn't guarantee he didn't have secrets, but Sita says she didn't find any. At the graveyard, Adil tells Sita that even if grave torture exists, it doesn't affect the body, but the soul. Sita counters that they said both the body and soul are tortured, to which Adil says he knows she has been researching this for years, but this is crazy. Sita insists she wants people to stop believing in superstitions, to which Adil points out that they saw a ghost in the tunnel with their own eyes. Sita counters that they were low on oxygen and hallucinated adding that someone needs to prove how religions use fear to drive people to do extreme things, like suicide bombing. Sita shows Adil the grave she found 10 years ago, and he reminds her that she heard nothing happened inside, asking if that isn't enough. She responds that it's not enough to convince others, and tells him if he doesn't want to help, that's fine. She says they will bury that man here, next to this one, to make sure that this man truly gets tortured in his grave. And it will happen to the one they are going to bury too. Adil asks, who is this person? To which she says he is the most ruthless man she has ever known. It is then revealed that the man buried in the grave was a serial killer, shot dead by the police. And the torture screams of Frizel recorded were said to have come from his grave. Meanwhile, Adil goes to his wife, who angrily throws out his bag and asks why he married her. 
He says it's because he loves her, to which she shuts the door, saying she needs a man who provides emotionally, not just financially, and demands a divorce. On the other hand, Sita confronts Wahyu, who explains that conscience is shaped by one's moral values or belief system, which doesn't necessarily have to be religious. He adds that his value system doesn't forbid lying, stealing, or even killing. He can commit these acts without guilt, and as long as he can cheat man's law, he faces no consequences. Sita asks if he doesn't believe in religion. Does he also think there will be no consequences after death? To which he questions what exactly gets tortured, the body or the soul? If it's the body, it will be long dead and feel nothing. Even if they do, the constant physical punishment will make them numb. He then brings up those who enjoy physical pain, wondering if they would enjoy the torture. Lastly, he raises the point that some people enjoy physical pain, so would they not enjoy the torture? And if it's the soul that suffers, why do religious teachings emphasize physical torture? He says he does whatever he likes, admitting his actions often clash with societal values, but insists he also does good. Sita retorts, like funding an Islamic boarding school and raping its students? Shocked, he asks, who are you? To which Sita reveals she was a student at one of his schools, and that her brother was one of his victims, though they managed to escape. She accuses him of having at least 50 victims, including one named Ismail, who went missing. He claims he gave everyone a better chance at life, even those she calls victims, Sita counters, questioning why he disappeared and changed his name. And only then does she realize that Adil has overheard their conversation. Enraged, Adil enters the room and rushes to choke Wahyu, but Sita intervenes, telling him to stop. Adil releases Wahyu and returns to Sita, and Wahyu tells Adil that he remembers him and also heard about what happened to their parents. He says he should have been able to give them better lives. Sita responds that their lives have a purpose, to witness what happens to people like him in the grave, because if a sinner of his caliber isn't tortured, it would prove religions are mere myths. Wahyu asks if she means torture by the angels Munker and Nakir, who appear beautiful to the pious and horrifying to the faithless. He questions what would be the most dreadful punishment, suggesting it depends on what one fears most. And he is sure what she fears the most is if everything they told her about grave torture turns out to be true. As their conversation unfolds, it becomes clear that Wahyu is recording everything on his phone. He describes his own torment as endless disorientation, something he has already endured. He expresses that life is a joke and those seeking meaning are fools, while others are losers. Then, he shoots himself, ending his life.